Y'all, I needed a break from sewing over the holidays, so this week, let's do a fun beginner-friendly video about corsetry. Yay! Navigating corset materials can be tough. There's so much information out there and so much cost involved, it can be overwhelming. What do you actually need to buy? Do you need to spend $40 a yard on cotille? Can you make stays out of quilting cotton? What the heck's the difference between spiral steel and straight steel? Have no fear, my friends. I've done all the hard work so you don't have have to. And I might even have some secret places where you can get corset supplies that won't wipe out your entire life savings. One of them I've actually only discovered within the last six months. And I've been making corsets and stays for a good 15 years. I've separated everything out into chapters so you can skip ahead or move back depending on the information you're looking for. Side note, I'm not sponsored by any of these businesses. Also, this information is based on my personal experiences and preferences, and others may have differing opinions. I welcome conversation about it in the comments, but please keep it constructive. For the most part, the materials for bodies, stays, and corsets are the same, so you can assume that what I'm saying applies to all unless otherwise specified. And I just wanna take a quick second to define these terms for newbies in a very generalized way. Bodies refer to structural garments from the late 16th and 17th centuries, basically from the Elizabethan period up through the 1680s. Stays refer to any structural garments from the 1680s Mantua explosion up through the 18th and into the early 19th century and the Regency period. Corsets refer to anything from the Romantic period of the 1820s all the way up through modern day. So how do you know what to buy? How do you know how much money you should spend? Good rule of thumb is to ask yourself some questions first. What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Historical or modern? If it's the formal, how much do you really care about historical accuracy? That's definitely going to affect your choice of materials. Also, how much do you actually have in your budget to spend? Is this a brand new era? Is this your first corset or your 50th? If you're new, trying a new era, or your budget is tight, don't spend a lot of money. I say this a lot, but it always bears repeating because I get folks who pop down at the comments and are like, I'm making my very first corset ever and I want it to be perfect. Corsetry and stay making is a skill. You have to do it to learn it. And you have to make shitty corsets before you can make nice corsets. It's like fine art. You can't expect without ever taking a drawing class to put pastel to paper and have it come out a masterpiece. You have to practice the craft first. And you don't wanna go buy the professional grade materials to draw your hand 70 times in three weeks when it's never gonna see the light of day. Instead, you wanna buy the student grade materials, the cheaper materials, and then you wanna go binge watch Bob Ross, practice a couple of paintings, and then go get the good stuff. You also need to consider how your body's corsets or stays are going to be worn. Is it for a reenactment? Is it a single event or cosplay that won't get another use? Or is it your favorite era of all time? Will you be wearing it in the winter or the summer? Is it hot where you live? If your stays are gonna get a lot of use or it's hot where you live, you may wanna invest in natural fibers at least for the final make. On the other hand, if it's only gonna get one or two uses, don't waste your money on silk satin that's $60 a yard. I spent some time making a snazzy flow chart that you can use to determine how much money and what kind of materials you should get for your particular project. It's up here on the screen. And if you'd like a larger one, you can download it for free on my Kofi page. I've linked in the pinned comment below. Let's talk about the fun stuff first, the fashion fabric. This is where you have the most wiggle room, so to speak, because the only hard fast rule here is that you don't want anything that has stretch. The stretch will warp your corset and make it a hot mess and it will not fit the way you want at the end. Just say no to Stretch Armstrong. That being said, not all fabrics are created equal. Ideally, you're looking for something that's meant to lightweight and tightly woven. Twills, linens, wools, cotton sateen, silk satin and taffeta, even quilting cotton are great options for this. The trick is to feel the fabric, test the hand. If you can see through it or it feels flimsy, more than likely your boning is going to try and escape. This is particularly important if you're using quilting cotton as not all quilting cottons are created equal. For example, these are my Regency stays. As you can see, the boning is starting to poke through in spots. The fashion fabric is upcycled from an old stained dress and it was fairly threadbare to begin with. 
I'm going to have to redo these or patch them. If I had known how much use these Regency stays were going to get, I would have used a totally better fabric. Whereas these are my very first pair of stays, which are more than 10 years old. As you can see, the quilting cotton has held up nicely because it was a little bit sturdier. Now of all of those options, what should you buy? If you're a beginner, nix the silk and nix the wool. Those are professional grade materials, especially the silk, which is not forgiving at all. It'll show your pin marks and it'll show any stitches that you take out on your corset or stays. Stick with your cheaper options. Quilting cotton, cotton sateen, a reasonably priced linen, or even poly shantung or satin. Yes, you can use polyester. See this corset? This is my Taco Bell bodice. Poly satin, y'all. Is it hot? Yeah but that's what I could afford at the time. Also, it's a bodice and there's not anything that's worn over top of it. And it was only meant to get a couple of uses instead of doing heavy lifting like my 18th century stays. It's okay to use poly if that's what you can afford. Don't let anyone tell you it's not. If your final make is going to be worn a lot, then do please consider using natural fibers, even if it's just quilting cotton. It's not that much cheaper anymore than poly's fabrics and most figures are gonna require more than a yard to make their corsets or stays. Personally, I can get two pairs of bodies or stays out of a single yard of fabric if I'm careful. Corsets, not so much, but I still generally use less than a yard. If the corset is utilitarian in nature, it's never gonna see the light of day, or if you splurge on some pretty inner lining, then you can just get away with having the interlining and lining layers and nix the fashion fabric altogether. Or if you want something super lightweight, you can just do inner lining and bone casing. I probably wouldn't do that unless you're on the smaller side of the spectrum, but the option is there if you'd like to try it. As far as lining goes, lighter weight cottons and linens are ideal. Quilting cotton, sateen, poplin might even work. Again, no stretch, but this fabric can be looser woven than your fashion fabric as long as you're using fashion fabric. If you're nixing the fashion fabric, then your lining needs to apply to the same rules as the fashion fabric does. But remember, the closer to your body a fabric is, the more you want it to be breathable. So prioritize your natural fibers from the inside out if your budget is tight. By far the most important thing to get right on your corsets, stays, and bodies are these structural layers. This is what gives the corset or stays or bodies its shape. So here we're gonna talk about false economy. Cut corners with your fashion fabric, not your interlining and boning. Because if you do, then you're setting yourself up for failure and more costs down the line. And we don't want that. I've learned the hard way that there is a right kind and a wrong kind of boning. Ridgeline is bad. If your pattern calls for Ridgeline boning, ignore it and go get something better. The flimsy plastic stuff that comes in its own bone casing is also not good. It kinks. Basically, if you can buy it at Joann's, it's not strong enough to support you in a proper corset or pair of stays. As I see it, you have five options. Straight steel, spiral steel, reed, synthetic whalebone, and zip ties. Straight steel is the most rigid. If you're making a corset and are using metal grommets, you must at least have one piece of straight steel on either side of your grommet channels. This is a hard, fast rule. Anything else will pucker under the strain. It's also good in corsets for any other straight, non-curvy seam. Spiral steel is almost as strong as straight steel and flexes in multiple directions. Use spiral steel anywhere where there is going to be a curve. For example, your side seams and your bust seams. The downside to steel is that it's heavy. The more you use, the heavier your corset is going to be. And you need to consider that if you're going to be wearing your corset a lot. Now you don't need to use steel for bodies or stays because those were not designed to reduce you at all. There isn't the pressure that corsets have. You can absolutely use steel if that was what you would like, but I will say the other downside to steel is that it is quite costly. Bodies and stays use a lot more boning than corsets do, so if you're stealing it up, you're racking it up too. For stays and bodies, I like zip ties, or if you have the budget or are going for more historical accuracy, you can use synthetic whalebone. Both these options are lighter weight than steel. I haven't personally used synthetic whalebone because I don't have the budget for it. Instead, I use zip ties for all of my bodies and stays. For corsets, I generally use steel for the seams that are loading the most weight. Center back and front, the sides and any of them that are curved. And then I supplement with the zip ties for the most cost-effective method. 
if you're really looking for something that's comfortable, lightweight, and historically accurate, you can use reed. Because it's wood, it breathes wonderfully. With that though, it's a little bit more costly than the plastic, requires some prep, and is notorious for snapping. So you have to replace them as they break, which is definitely not my jam. But hey, the option is there. If you're using steel, it is imperative that you finish your mock-up first before you buy your steel bones. Hey folks, editing Jackie here. So some of my footage got lost. It's no surprise because this is actually the third time that I filmed this entire thing. The first time the mic died, the second time the light died, and this last time all four of my camera batteries died. I think this video is cursed. The reason you need to finish your mock-up completely before you purchase your boning is because in the process of doing your mock-up, you may need to shorten or lengthen the pattern, which means that you're going to need longer or shorter bones depending on the modifications you make. And then you have to go buy all new boning, or you have to invest in steel cutters and tipping or tipping fluid and trust me, it's gonna save you a ton of money if you just wait. In addition, you may find, like I did recently, that the amount of boning called for in the pattern isn't enough for you to feel supported, or you need the opposite and require fewer bones than the pattern calls for. And if you're sitting there thinking, I'm not gonna make a mock-up. If you're watching this video for the information and not because you're one of my awesome subscribers that watches every video I do, then I can tell you off the bat, you are not skilled enough to make a corset without a mock-up and have it fit successfully at the end. I'm not skilled enough to do that and I've been doing this for 15 years, folks. That's crazy talk. One thing I did forget to mention when I was filming this originally is cording. Cording is also used in corsetry, especially when you're looking at things like the 1820s and 1830s and these early corsets, they use a lot of cording and they don't use boning. Off the top of my head, this also has a resurgence in the 1890s with things like the pretty housemaid corset. Corset interlining, not interfacing, that's different, is your other costly purchase. It needs to be a mid-weight, tightly woven fabric with zero stretch. This is because the boning juts up against this layer and needs to be secure to protect you from pokage. This is where the cotille comes in, and unfortunately, cotille ain't cheap. I use it as the interlining for all my corsetry that involves steel bones because it's the strongest and can hold up to the heavier duty materials. Better options for newbies or wearable mock-ups include denim, drill if you can find it, cotton canvas, or cotton duck. But you need to feel the duck. Don't just buy the duck because some of it's rather loosely woven like this stuff and you can't always tell if you're buying online. Tightly woven mid-weight linen also works really well here. Busks are pretty straightforward. You use wooden busks, for bodies and stays. I have used paint sticks as my busks in bodies before, but if you use paint sticks, be warned. Shoes before stays, y'all, or this will happen. And then your metal busks will be for your later period corsets. Notions are all the little stuff that you don't usually think about. These are pretty straightforward, but let's go through them anyway. Binding. Twill tape is good and cheap. You can buy a big roll of white cotton twill tape and then hand dye it to match each project. That's what I do. Bias tape is also great. It's less historically accurate, but if you don't care, it's easier to get around the curves because it has a little stretch and you can buy it in a myriad of different colors if you're too lazy to dye stuff. If you're making a pair of bodies or stays or a corset that's going to get worn a lot and take a lot of abuse, then leather is your best option for binding. But be warned, Working with leather is hard on your hands. It's quite expensive. And remember that once you poke a hole in leather, that hole is there forever. So don't mess up. I also suggest if you're using leather to bind each piece separately before you permanently sew your stays or corset together. Otherwise, you're going to have issues when you need to go in and make alterations later. Stay tape helps support the waist and prevent your corset from stretching. You can use grain ribbon or twill tape, anything that will take a little strain. You want it to be somewhere between three quarters to an inch in width. You will also need something to lace up your corset. Poly lacing, cotton lacing, if you're going for historical accuracy, linen lacing. You can even use ribbon, but I find that ribbon, especially the satiny stuff, is slippery and doesn't stay as well. Again, I buy a bunch of white cotton lacing and then I dye it to match each project. If you're making a corset, i.e. reducing your waist down at all, you need metal grommets. Anything from 1830 onward really wants a metal grommet. 
Handworked eyelets will rip, ask me how I know. I find that zero zero size grommets are better than the larger size zero, especially in a waist reducing style that benefits from more grommets in smaller increments. You can use metal grommets in earlier styles if you don't care about historical accuracy, but that's entirely up to you. Personally, I find handworked eyelets easier to do, especially since I live in an apartment in a hot climate, I have to do it outside, I bother the neighbors, so I always opt for eyelets whenever possible, but again, that's my personal preference. Only my neighbors were as considerate of me as I was of them, right? Note that for metal grommets, you will need an awl and a tool to set the grommets in. These things get pricey. The cheap ones run about $25 a piece, and you need a separate one for each size of grommet that you're gonna use. If you go for eyelets instead, all you need is the awl. All I need now is the awl. Finally, if you'd like, you can purchase bone casing. If you use bone casing, you can reduce the bulk and the weight of your corset since the boning lives in the casing instead of between layers of fabric. I definitely suggest using bone casing on specifically corsets where the boning is going to be on the seam so that you can pop them off to alter your seams when necessary. I will say it gets a little pricey, so I only use it when I have to. Okay, so now we know what to buy. Where the heck do we get this stuff? Fashion fabric, I mean, anywhere. Joann's, your local store, the thrift shop. There are so many options, it's really hard to give you a specific location to shop for fashion fabric and lining. I do wanna highlight just a couple of places for those who are interested in specifically historical makes, as that is a little bit more specialized. Do please note that most of these places are based in the continental US because that's what I know and that's where I shop. I will mention international shops that have been recommended to me when I can. If you have further recommendations for international places, please drop down into the comments and tell me the name of the store. Please don't link me directly because more than likely YouTube will eat your comment. The first is Burnley and Trowbridge. These folks work out of Virginia and are a staple for historical costuming, especially if you're interested in the 18th century. They are really good about mentioning which era a fabric is appropriate for as well as giving suggested uses in the comments. So it takes a little bit of the guesswork out of which fabrics are going to be useful for your bodies and stays. Go here specifically for your wool fashion fabric and your linen fashion fabric and lining. They do have some silks and they're reasonably priced, but their options are limited and generally paler than the colors that I personally like to wear. They do have this really nice mid-weight herringbone linen that I use as the interlining layer for all of my historical bodies and stays. Because it's linen, it's super breathable. The catch is it's not always available, so I make a point of ordering a yard or two when I'm ordering from B&T anyway, so that I have it on hand when I'm ready to use it. Sometimes they have it in white, Sometimes it's in beige or a brown color. They also sell a lot of other supplies and notions like your tapes, cords, boning, and aglets if you want to use them so they are a great one-time shop. The catch is the shipping can be costly. So like other places I'm going to mention, I suggest keeping a running list of things that you want to make or need to buy and ordering a bunch of stuff at once to save a little money. Renaissance Fabrics is organized the same way. This is where I buy my cotton sateen. I find it's reasonably priced and good quality. And they sell it in white, which is viable with fiber reactive dyes and what I use to make my gorgeous green Victorian corset. It's held up really well so far. They also have a large selection of silks for those of you who are ready to buy the Monet grade materials, and I've found them to be superior in quality to other shops. If you think ahead, they occasionally have sales. Again, they have a lot of notions you can pick up if you're ordering from them, and I like that they have a broader era focus than B&T, including a lot of fabrics that are good for earlier eras and in less pastel-y options. They also have colored cotton cording for your lacing and natural fiber bias tape, which is awesome. Again, shipping's a little expensive, so plan accordingly. Fabricstore.com is your go-to for linen. Thanks to inflation, their colored linens are less affordable than they used to be, but if you sign up for their newsletter, you can get a 38% off coupon for their unbleached 5.3 ounce linen, which is again, dyeable and good from everything from shifts to linings. Save up, buy a chunky bit at once, and you're good for years. For zip ties, check your local hardware store. I usually get them from Amazon, but unfortunately I can't link you to the ones I use because like a lot of other things on that platform, they're there and then they disappear forever and you have to search to find another brand. You wanna look for something that has the millimeter width range of what the pattern you're working with calls for. Personally, I like the 18 inch or better 24 inch zip ties with a tensile strength of about 180 to 200 pounds. 
CorsetMaking.com is your single one-stop shop. It has any kind of boning you want. It's the only place I've found Reed. It also has a lot of specialty busks if you want something that's not standard. You can also buy hoop steel here, coutile in various kinds, including with designs, all your tapes, notions, grommets, and setting tools. I mean, anything you want, they've got. They also have millinery buckram, which can be hard to find. So like the linen at BNT, I always buy a yard of two from them when I'm already making a purchase, so I have it on hand. While it has the most reasonably priced continuous rolls of synthetic whalebone I've seen, convenience comes at a price and you are paying a premium premium for everything else on this site. Richard the Thread has fewer options, but they are a corsetry supplier by nature. If you're looking for bulk boning or busks, they have it. They also have grommet setting tools and grommets, but the tools are way more expensive than corsetmaking.com. They've got your tapes and cords and a lot of other supplies. They also have the cheapest cotille, running at about $20 a yard. This is what I use and it's really nice. They also sell dyed cotille, but they use RIT, so it's gonna fade if you wash it. Or you could buy it in white and properly dye it like I do. One note with these guys is that their online ordering is a little weird, and you won't know the price of your shipping until they send you the invoice. And again, it's pricey, so... <laughs> but the all-time best place to buy all of your corsetry notions, busks, and boning is Wawak. I only discovered this place recently, and holy crap, y'all, look at the difference in pricing. A 12-inch piece of steel boning is a dollar and a penny on corsetmaking.com. It's 52 cents on Wawak. A 12-inch busk on corsetmaking is 13.50. At Wawak, 4.49. Bonus, their shipping is a flat 5.95, and it's pretty fast. They have the cheapest twill tape, any kind of bias tape you want, and super cheap grommets. Although oddly they don't come in brass or antique gold, but they have like a gazillion other different colors. Grommet setting tools are weirdly expensive here, but otherwise this is my go-to for supplies from here on out. If you're in Canada, the best place for you is Farthingales. They've got all your basic corsetry supplies and more. MacFab Sews is also great for all your sewing notions and tailoring supplies. UK and Europe, there are a bunch of great options for you. Vina Cava is a lot like corsetmaking.com in that they are definitely a one-stop shop. Nehalenia Patterns has a lot of basic corsetry supplies as well as some great patterns, including the only 1660s commercial pattern that's available outside of the pattern of fashion books. La Rose Passementerie also has a lot of great basic corsetry supplies. If you're in France, Alice Création also has a lot of your corsetry notions. Wissner out of Germany is great for bulk orders of Boning. Apologize for my pronunciations. I wasn't able to get recommendations from my viewers in other areas, unfortunately. So if you live outside the US, Canada, UK, and Europe, please pop down into the comments below and let me know where you get your supplies so I can help the other folks out. Okay, I know editing Jackie is really tired of hearing my voice by now, but if you're not and you're ready for some more corsetry content, perhaps you'd like to click right here and learn the best practices for fitting a Victorian corset. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for making it to the end. I love y'all and I'll catch you in my next video.